to its economy, but it would also hurt ordinary Europeans who are already seeing the cost of their living soar. We have to find a solution how we, as uh, soon as we can, phase out of this uh, fossil fuel deliveries, but for the moment it is still extremely difficult. But this would make, of course, a huge impact because right now, every day, uh, we transfer seven to 800 million euros um, on the state budget or to the state budget of Russia. Since the end of February, the West has imposed thousands of sanctions on Russia for its aggression towards Ukraine. In just weeks, Russia has overtaken Iran to become the most sanctioned country in the world. It's not clear if this pressure will be enough to force Russia to stop. And joining us now is DW correspondent Christine Mundua, who filed that report. She joins us from Brussels. Christine, nice to see you. Oil and gas still exempt. Thousands of sanctions, but still no oil and gas sanctions. Can the pressure on Moscow ever be enough without that step? That's a very good question. It's a question I put uh, to a lawmaker here in Europe. The challenge uh, the Europeans have is that going for the oil and gas sector in Russia would immediately and directly impact uh, the lives and livelihoods of Europeans. Indeed, the inflation is soaring in the European Union. Um, there have been protests in countries like Italy, for example, because of the rising fuel prices. Um, so European leaders are reluctant uh, to, to, to force a situation that will uh, directly impact on the livelihoods uh, of Europeans. For example, they could target the oil because it is much easier to find alternative oil markets. But as a lawmaker said to me, what if Russia retaliates by turning off the gas? So Certainly Europe is coming out of the, the winter months, but this could also result in blackouts, power blackouts in the European economy, which would have a direct impact uh, on economic growth. So it appears right now the Europeans first need to find safer alternatives, particularly on the gas front, uh, before they're able to take that heavy blow. Christine, NATO defence ministers will meet today to discuss the reinforcement of member states in Eastern Europe. Is that a sign, do you think, that NATO is concerned the Russian invasion could spill over into NATO territory? Absolutely. And, and you're certainly hearing it um, from allies uh, on the eastern flank. Uh, you're certainly hearing it from the Baltic states who have long felt insecure and vulnerable um, and have been the most vocal in terms of calling for more deployments uh, on existing units in, in their territories, for example. So uh, there are real indications uh, just by how much NATO has been ramping up its forces, how much it's been bolstering units, uh, that they genuinely feel that this could encroach into NATO territories and they are preparing themselves to defend any ally in the event that that were to happen. Uh, as uh, the Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg was pointing out, um, some of these plans are even longer term plans, so not necessarily in the short term, uh, and they will require uh, additional investment, significant additional investment uh, by NATO members and of course we've seen that already by a number of them Germany for example mm. making significant increases to defense budget spending is there a chance that NATO could still be dragged into this war even if member states aren't directly targeted very unlikely, uh, Rebecca. As we talk this morning, um, I can firmly say no. Um, and this is because we have seen NATO and we've heard the, the commitments and, and about we will support Ukraine, humanitarian efforts, we will send military aid, um, everything just short of directly uh, engaging Russia potentially. Um, and so, for example, a no-fly zone of Ukrainian air is, uh, of the Ukrainian skies is, is not an option. Neither is the option of sending Western troops to Ukraine to fight alongside uh, the Ukrainians as they battle the Russians. So that is a definitive no at this stage. Whether or not that changes at some point, even as there are more growing calls from more people in Europe for NATO to be involved, um, it is very unlikely that that will be happening anytime soon. Right. Christine, thank you. DW Brussels correspondent Christine Mundwa. More than three million people have now fled Ukraine since Russia invaded nearly three weeks ago. Many of them have ended up in neighbouring Poland. In recent years, Warsaw has refused to take in migrants from other countries, but now in what is being called a major U-turn, they've changed the law to allow the new refugees to live and work legally. Przemysl, near the Polish-Ukrainian border, a city of 60,000 people. Thousands of refugees from Ukraine arrive here every day. Many of them have no idea what they will do next and where they will live. But after the Polish parliament passed a law guaranteeing them support, they want to register in the Polish social system as soon as possible. At the city hall, a family from Lviv is submitting their applications. But that doesn't mean they want Poland to become their second homeland. We submitted the documents to get a Polish registration number. And what will happen next? How do you see your future? I don't know. Now I'm here, then I'll go back home. I'll only be here temporarily. Alexandra's 55-year-old husband had to stay at home in Lviv. Ukrainian men are barred from leaving the country. His mother is sitting nearby in the waiting room. My son did not leave because he stayed in Lviv to defend the city. If they attack Lviv, someone has to be there. My sister also stayed there together with my son. Zenobia wants to stay temporarily in this border region, as close to her loved ones as possible. She also hopes that she will soon return to them. The registration procedure for one person takes about half an hour. The government says it's opening offices this week to help process applications. But the officials working at this office are struggling to cope with the vast number of applicants. At the moment, I have one section taking care of ID cards and population records. It's seven people, but only two can be assigned to new tasks because of a lack of equipment. For example, there are only four fingerprint machines. Meanwhile, in this border region, there are tens of thousands of refugees. Many of them will try to register here in Przemysl as soon as possible to get the support guaranteed by the new law. Once registered in Poland, the Ukrainian refugees will get access to schools, to health services, and even to a small amount of money for living expenses. But the whole registration process of hundreds of thousands of refugees can take a very long time. This is a challenge the Polish authorities have never faced before. 
One Ukrainian conductor is fighting for her homeland on social media and in concert halls. Oksana Linev is already a trailblazer, the first woman to conduct a Germany's famous Wagner opera festival. Now the war in her homeland has left her feeling helpless, though she's determined to oppose it. DW caught up with her in Rome. A concert for peace conducted by Oksana Linev. She's visibly distressed by the war in her home country, Ukraine. Recently, she joined the orchestra of the Teatro Comunale di Bologna. They're playing a piece by Ukrainian composer Yuri Shevchenko. This intimate interpretation sounds like a prayer. We met Linev in Rome, where she's preparing to conduct the opera Turandot by Puccini. She's deeply worried and shaken. I'm not just afraid for my family. I'm afraid for everyone. I'm afraid for my country and afraid for the places where I work, like the Lviv National Opera, the Odessa National Opera. They're stunning architectural gems. I'm afraid for old cities that are UNESCO cultural heritage sites. Linev studied music in Lviv, not far from Brody, where she grew up and where her family remain. My mother and her sister, my aunt, are hiding in a sort of bunker. It's actually a potato cellar, but it's an old Nazi bunker from World War II. My father made it a bit more livable there and less damp. He continues putting on concerts with his choir, and my mother sings in it too. They sing patriotic songs to keep up the Ukrainian spirits. Linov has long been a big name outside Ukraine. She's performed throughout Europe at the Bayreuth Festival and with the Berlin Philharmonic, but the last few weeks have been her most challenging. It's been a horrible time for me. I'm here in Europe where I can conduct. I can sleep in a nice hotel. I can keep doing my job. The Youth Orchestra of Ukraine brings together musicians from the countries east and west. It was founded in 2017 by Oksana Linev with a political purpose. Her aim was to emphasize Ukraine's unity. The cultural front is at least as important to me as the physical front line. And that's why it's so hard for me to conduct. But still, I understand that we can't give up now. I dedicate every performance, my art and my job, to our fight for freedom. You're watching DW News. Here's a recap of the latest developments in the Ukraine war. Russia has stepped up its bombardments of Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. A residential building has been damaged. Ukraine says Russian forces have also attacked its second largest city, Kharkiv. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says peace talks with Russia have become more constructive, but that more time is still needed. That's your news update. We'll have more news headlines for you at the top of the hour. You can also get in-depth, round-the-clock coverage of the war in Ukraine on our website. That's DW.com, as well as our social media channels. Our handle is at DW News. I'm Rebecca Ritters in Berlin. Thanks very much for watching. India, zero waste, a utopian goal for the film industry. On an average, we've seen a shoot generates about eight to 10,000 kilos every single month. A bad movie, say activists from Bollywood, and are rewriting the script. Major props, waste separation bins and sustainable materials. Zero waste, a future box office hit. Eco India, next on DW. Abused and forcibly assimilated. They put me in a little jail and call it a reserve. And say, you're not part of Canada. You will never be part of Canada. Up until 1996, Canada's indigenous peoples were victims of cultural genocide. The reconciliation process is beginning now. In 45 minutes on DW. Hello guys, this is the 77%, the platform for Africa's youth to debate issues and share ideas. You know on this channel, we are not afraid to tackle delicate topics. The young people clearly have the solutions. The future belongs to you. The 77% every weekend on DW. <laughs> Thank you.
convenience, food, fast fashion, online shopping. The culture of consumption has the entire planet drowning in waste. How can we break the cycle of take, make and throw away? That's what we're diving into today here on Eco India. Hello and welcome, I'm Sanuta Raghu. The world produces more than 2 billion tons of waste every year. A lot of it is food packaging. But it also includes masses of goods that are trashed within six months of purchase. The zero waste movement calls for reducing and reusing products to conserve natural resources and cut pollution. We found signs here in India that it's catching on, with even Bollywood jumping on the wagon. <laughs> Mohammed Ishaq is the local jack of all trades around these neighborhoods of South Delhi. I repair gas burners, pressure cookers, mixy jars, zips of jackets and jeans. I repair many things. Merchants like Ishaq were once a much more common sight in big cities, going door to door, fixing anything people owned to the extent they could. And when those items broke, they fixed them again. But things have been changing in India as the practices of Western convenience culture have taken root. One indicator of this is the amount of waste the country now produces. It is estimated that India generates over 150,000 tons of solid waste every day, which is not as much as some Western countries, but this is likely to go up to more than double by 2025. The volumes continue to go rise because year on year we're adding on new kinds of waste. I think the waste uh, composition also is shifting. There are new materials coming into waste stream. Then you also add it with uh, more of batteries, more of uh, CFL lights, more of... And we don't have a separate management system. So there has been a lot of emphasis and a lot of focus on trying to enforce or implement or encourage people on source segregation. Source segregation is when people collect solid and wet waste separately at the first instance. The low rate of this practice across Indian cities is a matter of concern. Equally, municipal waste management authorities in Indian cities have their priorities skewed. The majority of its funds go into collection and transportation with little left for managing and processing the waste. One industry that generates massive amounts of waste is Bollywood. From the set itself to catering services that provide three meals a day for large numbers of people. Usually it goes directly to the dump, but something different is happening on this film set today. So basically we have a core crew of around 150 that we have on set every day and there's a floating crew of around 200 to 250. At first people didn't really bother, but these guys have made sure that people get to know. Now even if the people don't understand the process, they at least know that we have two bins and the waste needs to be segregated. Divya Ravi Chandran owns the company managing waste at the shoot. It's called Scrap and she started it in 2017. A typical shoot like this would generate anywhere between uh, 15,000 to 30,000 kilos of waste. On an average, we've seen a shoot generates about 8 to 10,000 kilos every single month. Scrap's first project was at the Weekender NH7 Music Festival, a two-day concert, where the company managed over 7 tons of trash, processing over 80% of it, which would have otherwise gone to a landfill. Divya Ravi Chandran herself says she only produces 100 grams of garbage a year, trying to live a zero-waste lifestyle herself. Zero waste is a philosophy that aims to produce as little garbage as possible, and ideally, none at all. Proponents apply this approach to all aspects of life, avoiding food waste, switching to low emission travel, and reusing materials to keep them out of landfills or dumping grounds. In 2016, a massive fire broke out in Mumbai's Leonardo Dumping The fire raged on for over a week. For the first time, I looked inside my bin and asked myself, where did this trash really go? What is a dumping ground and why is it on fire? On the set of a Netflix film called Chandigarh Pere Ashipi, the scrap team is not just separating rubbish, it is also teaching waste management. One way to reduce the volume of garbage produced is to replace plastic with more sustainable materials. When you look at a lot of single-use plastic, it is replaceable. They are not unessential. They are only uh, because we haven't applied ourselves very effectively and that is why we continue to use it. Scrap works to close the gap by donating any leftover but edible food from events to partner NGOs. <laughs> We distribute the food among the 200 children and 300 families from what we receive. We try to ensure that all the food is evenly distributed to the children. About 30-40 children have got the food. Isak's income and the livelihood of merchants like him are on the decline, but the philosophy they uphold is more relevant than ever. Cutting down on waste requires a multi-pronged approach. Rediscovering ways in which things can be repurposed, like in the old days, will play an integral role as we attempt to dig ourselves out of the mess we have created. Now, separating household waste is common practice in Germany, which is widely lauded as a world recycling champion. But a surprisingly large share of the country's plastic packaging has ended up on the other side of the globe. Our reporter shed some light on a dark side of the global trade in garbage. These containers sitting at a port in Manila almost triggered a war. They were full of garbage, including used adult diapers, and the Philippines refused to let them into the country. President Rodrigo Duterte just told Trudeau that he has one week for its war. After rotting in the sun for nearly six years, Canada finally took its waste back and burned it. It made headlines everywhere and revealed the dark underbelly of the global plastic waste network. It's rife with corruption, run by private traders and fly-by-night establishments, and Interpol found that it could be worse. We often find the same names linked to other crimes. 
money laundering, tax evasion, fraud. It's all the same criminals. And the currency driving it all is plastic scrap. I want to find out more about what's going on, but everybody I'm speaking to seems to be answering in code. So how does the global plastic waste trade even work? And how can we get out of this mess? Enter China. By the 90s, China was becoming the world's manufacturer. Every day, shipping containers carrying all sorts of products would journey to the US and Europe. But when they returned empty, they became a serious financial opportunity. The West consumed, collected its waste and shipped it out of sight to China. China recycled what it could and sent back new products for more consumption. And this cycle was on repeat. And it was dirt cheap. For example, one US trader told me that even in 2010, while it cost around $85 to dispose of a ton of waste domestically, it cost only 35 to ship a ton of it to China. Could there be a sweeter deal, really? When low-grade or contaminated plastic was sent to China, either cheap labor was needed to sort it, or it had to be dumped and burnt. Within a few years, several Chinese towns near landfills and incineration sites started complaining of polluted air and water. Cancer rates rose. So by 2018, China had had enough. It effectively banned all plastic waste imports, and the world had lost its number one recycler. But China was prepared. Their recycling industry was established, and the country was now producing enough waste domestically to supply its own raw materials for recycling. So post-ban, the rest of the world was scrambling. Some waste was burnt within the countries, but shipments of garbage still needed to find new destinations. And they found them soon enough in countries close to China like Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, etc. Heng Chun is a campaigner with Greenpeace in Malaysia, the country that became the leading importer at the time. India is the fourth biggest importer. So Greenpeace, along with citizens, are now demanding that the West stop using them as the waste dumps of the world. Especially the rich, richer country that produce lots of waste and then they put it to the global south. And then they're shipping the problem to the global south. But here's where it all got really murky. You can't just recycle any plastic. They come in grades that you can tell by looking at the bottom of the container. And each grade needs to be recycled on its own in a specific recycling plant. It only makes sense to recycle high-grade plastic, like a shampoo bottle or a detergent container, because what comes out on the other side still has value. But things like styrofoam that food comes in can never be recycled, which means they'll only ever be used once. This is, you know, let's say a container full of plastic. Yuhani Grossman looks into corruption in environmental-related businesses around the world. The government is going to pay, I don't know what, $5,000, I'm just making the figure out, to recycle it. And then the company says, okay, we're not actually going to recycle it, so we're going to keep $1,000. And then we're going to spend $500 to send the container, and we're going to pay somebody $1,000 in Indonesia to make it disappear. And then we still have $2,500 profit. It's something like that. And companies in Asian countries are willing to take the plastic in. Local waste collection is much less developed here, and so clean plastic can be used to feed the upcoming recycling industries. But here's where laws can be broken. The Basel Convention is the international treaty that stipulates which plastics can and can't be traded. It says, for example, that contaminated or low-grade plastics need special permission from the receiving country's governments before they can be shipped. But independent investigators found that plastic traders have discovered ways to bypass this. First, waste shipments can be mislabeled and pass through customs checks in the West. And then companies in developing countries who offer to take in low-grade or unsorted plastic find ways to smuggle it past the local authorities. Even if checks take place, they can be evaded. And so the most obvious way in which corruption comes into play is to bribe officials uh, to allow you to import that waste. Once allowed into the country, traders need to find a way to make money from the bad plastic. Investigators found unsuitable disposal, including into rivers, landfills and plantations, along with cheap labor to be the main modus operandi. So basically the same things that happened in China. But there's even more criminal energy in this. Many criminals are relying on money laundering techniques, and this typically would take the form of a legal waste company that would engage in both legal and illegal trade, and then mix the payments across these two business lines. Ilsa Hart's foundation has investigated the role of money laundering and tax fraud across the waste trade industry. For environmental crimes, this is a particularly effective strategy because it can be very difficult for authorities in the private sector to distinguish between legal and illegal trades. Proceeds from the illegal waste trade could be up to $12 billion annually. Um, and for waste trafficking, many of the profits remained in the exporting countries, with importing countries only generating part of the profits from resale or reuse of certain waste. From 2021, the Basel Convention toughened regulations. More types of plastic were banned. But environmentalists say this still doesn't go far enough. If we leave the door slightly open, someone will go through it. Pierre Condomine's group fights for environmental justice. In November 2021, it